you're passionate about transforming retail operations and improving performance, plus you're accountable for key change projects and programs in your company, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Retail Transformation Show with me, Oliver Banks. Well, hello there and welcome to the Retail Transformation Show. I'm Oliver Banks, your host and your guide to successfully deliver retail transformation. Thanks for tuning in. This one is episode 109, number 109. One of the big trends that we have seen over the past few years in the retail marketplace is that of pop-up stores. They've been particularly prevalent in the direct-to-consumer, the DTC brand markets, but we've seen some retailers do some great things as well. But of course, 2020 has put a little speed bump in the road of all things physical retail. But I think this trend is still going to continue to surge forward, particularly as we look into next year. So to explore this in a lot more detail, I'm really excited to introduce you to the expert in pop-up retail. She wrote the book on ephemeral retailing, and she is Khalia Bustani, or should I say Dr. Khalia Bustani. She's based in Paris in France, and she's a researcher and particularly focused on short-term ephemeral retailing or pop-ups. She completed her first study on pop-up stores out in the Middle East, and now she's focused on Europe. Khalia has been teaching marketing and fashion marketing and retail across several different universities and business schools since 2011. And she's also worked very closely with professionals and entrepreneurs and businesses on various projects to progress the research and, of course, the commercial viability as well. As I mentioned, she did write the book Ephemeral Retailing Pop-Up Stores in a Postmodern Consumption Era. And she also hosts regular Instagram live chats, really to dive in deep with a whole variety of experts. So do check that out. I'm going to put the links on the show notes page today, which is obandco.uk slash 109. That's obandco.uk slash 109. Oh, and do stay tuned till the end of the episode for a special announcement. This conversation is a good one, but it's a little longer than normal. So let's jump straight on in. Here is Khalia Bustani. Khalia, welcome to the Retail Transformation Show. How are things? Hi, Oliver. Well, things are very well, and I'm very glad I get to do this discussion with you on the Retail Transformation Show. I'm really excited too. I loved joining you for your Instagram live show. We had a great conversation there. So time to turn the tables and dive into your specialist subject pop-up retailing. Yes, I'm very glad that you're doing this. And thank you for also joining me on the live show last time. And I'll be happy to elaborate everything I know about pop-up stores. Awesome. Well, this is absolutely a a really big topic right now. Coronavirus and uh, COVID aside, pop-up has been one of the, the big trends that we've seen in the world of retail over the past few years. More and more companies, particularly the direct-to-consumer companies, have been getting into it. But let's just make sure that we're all on the same page. What do we mean by pop-up retail? Well, let's go back to the initial types of commerce. I mean, the concept of temporality has been observed since the beginning of commerce. Peddlers, merchants traveled between different cities to barter, trade, or sell. I mean, you could also think of circuses, fairs, trades, or exhibitions that moved, settled, and then left to a new location. So retail is known in this mobile, transient, and short-lived forms that invite customers to visit and discover them, right? Mm. I mean, physical formats have set standards for so long in retail, from specialty stores to department stores to shopping malls or concept stores or flagship stores. And online retailing has caused a major disturbance and slowly integrated online channels amongst other channels that a retail brand can adopt. Mm. And the survival of retail brands has been put to test in the past decade, and this is due to the recession and other environmental forces, and as you mentioned earlier, like the COVID situation. Mm. 
Therefore, alternative distributions and communications had to be prioritized. And pop-up stores are an example. And to answer your question, Oliver, pop-up stores are today at the crossroads of communications and distribution channels as they appear unannounced, they disappear or morph into something new. Yeah. They could look like any other type of store format, except that they tend to be conceived with a theatrical, interactive, or immersive approach. They are short-lived and appear in strategic locations, and they are very much related to seasonal events. And if I may add, uh, from a brand's point of view, pop-up stores are like great tools to test, experiment, sell, communicate, or increase visibility. And they could be also seen as media through which a story is told or a message is shared with a target audience. Mm. And they could be a strategic quick fix, if I may call it that way, that could be integrated in a brand's overall strategy. Mm. And maybe to, to conclude on that part, from a customer's perspective, pop-up stores provide a lot of novelty. There are events that could not be missed, and there are opportunities to come closer to the brand. I mean, this is a happening that a customer should go to, and that will always excite him. Indeed. I really love that thought about actually using them for experimentation, as well as some of those more, I suppose, exciting elements that are bringing in events and theatrics, as you say. I think there's huge opportunities. It can be, really be quite a blank canvas, I think. Exactly. You mentioned that they're quite short term. Yes. What are we talking about in terms of short term? I suppose it could be anything from, from a day, I suppose, at least, to, to what? Yes. I mean, even we're talking today about pop-up stores that uh, could go just for a couple of hours. Wow, getting quick. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> we can talk about that a bit later when we're when we're discussing like the characteristics of pop-up stores. But to answer mm. that question in particular, we could go from uh, a day to a couple of months. It really depends on the type of brand, whether it's a startup brand or a mature brand, or it could also be different between the types of luxury brands or uh, mass fashion brands or different industry levels because we'll be discussing this further down luxury brands could for example adopt pop-up stores that they would do that for at least a year or 18 months whereas other pop-up stores could pop in for a week or maybe uh, a couple of weeks so in average mm. let's say that a pop-up store could last in between a week or two which is the ideal average uh, timeline Enough to build momentum and get people to talk and share about it, but not too much that it gets old and, and boring. Exactly. And we don't want uh, people to confuse that store with a physical store opening and uh, staying for so long on that location. Yes. Yes. Very good point. So physical retail, you know, let's be honest, 2020 has not been a great year for physical retail. <laughs> How has that impacted or affected uh, pop-up stores and pop-up strategies? Well, it's a very important uh, question. But it's really also uh, important to highlight the difference between pop-up retail and physical retail because we tend to have like mashed up lines that are very confusing at, at some point. Excellent. Let's break it down. What's the difference? <laughs> yeah. So given that pop-up stores are more flexible and agile, and I really highlight on that word, they are agile in their nature and they can highly benefit a brand on many levels. Mm. As we have visibility, brand image, communications, awareness, etc. It's important to stress on the fact that pop-up stores do not replace permanent traditional stores. This is very important. However, Pop-up stores can complete other retail formats by filling in the gap. For instance, they can give a digital native brand a physical presence when needed. They can expand the geographical reach of physical stores as they can appear in different locations at one time and during or during different times. Moreover, with pop-up stores, the brand can have a greater visibility and generate positive word of mouth. They get people talking online and offline. 
Moreover, uh, when the brand is active on social media, an important online exchange between brand and customers and customers and their peers takes place. I mean, this is an undeniable advantage that pop-up stores have over other retail formats and let the brand come closer to the uh, target audience, collect vital information and knowledge from them. So if I may put it that way, Oliver, the pop-up comes to life and interesting conversations between brand and customer take place. And this social dimension is very important to pop-up stores. Mm. And it is one of their characterizing features because this is what makes the pop-up store a dynamic, fun, interactive, and a happy place. I mean, the retail comes to life. And this is a dimension that we do not always see or we cannot see in a physical or traditional retail format. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, uh, you know, it's what I'm what I'm hearing because there are so many different elements for pop-up stores. It must be very important to really understand the objectives, the aims, the goals for your particular pop-up rather than just doing it because you can. You know, you could do it in several different directions, right? Right. I mean, this is a very important thing as you highlighted it, Oliver, because pop up stores in their nature are very exciting, but we cannot just jump in and do a pop up store, especially if it does not fit into our brand strategy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not on brand and on topic and in line with, with your values and your purpose, it could just seem very disjointed and actually potentially brand damaging, particularly if executed badly. Exactly. I mean, some brand managers could tell you, and here there's always this mashed up line between what could be done and what could Mm. not be done. Sometimes we can say that with pop-up stores, we can pop in to test something because customers tend to forgive and forget since this format is very short-lived. However, we should avoid doing mistakes by popping in the wrong way. I mean, testing is one thing and just doing things haphazardly is another thing. We should really think of how a a pop-up store aligns with our brand strategy and objectives. And then if we wish to test a new concept under our brand strategy, we could do that. However, things should not look like uh, they are very alien uh, or uh, that disjoint, as you said, from our initial core or from our brand's essence. And this is really important. Mm. So bringing us back to thinking about how 2020 has been for for pop-up and what 2021 looks like as well, Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts? Uh, Have we seen an uptake in pop-up store usage or has it fallen away? Pop-up stores have been picking up and they really picked up in the past uh, couple of years because retail needed a sense of novelty, innovation and excitement. But we have to also be very clear that today pop-up stores pop up physically and we cannot pop up physically if there are no people to come into our pop-up store. (laughs) (laughs) It's like uh, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? If a pop-up opens in a street with no footfall, does it actually open? (laughs) Exactly. Knowing that a pop-up store really takes advantage of the footfall. But I would like to highlight a very important uh, element that has been going on with the pop-up stores lately is that brands are also going into online pop-up stores, which is even more exciting uh, because Mm. they are very short-lived. They could pop in for a couple of hours, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, there's a lot happening in this session of the pop-up because the brand gets to really connect with the target audience, especially through social media sites. There are lots of live stream selling. Uh, The brand presents the product, shows the customer how the product works. Brand reps are live in front of their customers and there's a lot happening there. And things have to be instant. I mean, I present the product to you, you either take it or leave it and you don't have much time to think about it. We're just streaming for a couple of hours. Wow. This is a really interesting format happening and going on. And just to add up, if 
the pop-up store happens to be a physical, brands today are also adding up this uh, dimension, like this virtual online dimension to even excite people to visit and uh, or entice them even to, to take action towards what the brand is offering. Mm. I mean, that whole online pop-up stores is a really interesting concept. You know, it's really pushing on that, that sort of FOMO, fear of missing out exactly. element. And actually, it's almost, particularly with the live streaming element, it reminds me of home shopping from from TV, you know, QVC and so on. Yeah. Where, you know, here's an hour and we're talking about hair products or whatever and then yeah. that's the end and it's it's finished. Is that how we're how we're looking at sort of online pop up stores almost? Uh yeah, if we want to really simplify things, yes. I mean today brands like uh I think um medical reps or even restaurants or chefs are doing these types of online pop-up stores or bakeries maybe. Uh, They are just here showing you how it works, how they do the dough, how they prepare the pasta, etc. And they sell you the thing right away. I mean, as you have said, uh, it looks a lot like the TV shows that we used to see and it has this also interactive dimension uh, which is uh, very interactive between customer and brand and makes things very exciting for both. Yeah, and we've certainly seen that huge uptake in live streaming, particularly yes. coming out of China, which you know has, has really taken it. I think the Western world, or certainly the UK, hasn't really taken up live streaming as I hoped uh, we would do over the past over the past few months to be honest mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to add on that Oliver if I may we have noticed that uh, most of the department stores uh, have uh, adopted a little bit of that uh, live streaming into saying okay take an appointment we will have a tour with you, like a personalized tour inside the store. We'll show you things. I will discuss with you. Our brand reps will give you the needed information, and this would help you sell. I mean, they have adopted this partially, but as you said, it didn't take the the, the gravity or the importance uh, as the Chinese uh, culture had uh, in, in terms of retail. And we should really think about that uh, in, in our country. It's really important to do that. Well. Mm. So let's consider, I suppose, both online and physical pop-up stores as we as we go forward. Mm-hmm. How do you make a pop-up store successful? And I suppose the flip side of that, what are the mistakes and common pitfalls to avoid? Mm-hmm. Well, what makes a pop-up store successful is preparation. I mean, preparation is key to a pop-up store's success. Again, mm. it has to align with the brand strategy and objectives. A pop-up store's atmosphere also should be thought of in, and it should be themed and engaging. I mean, Oliver, we have to think of our spaces like open spaces or closed spaces, the degrees of interaction that the customer could have in that space. It's really important to think of those things when conceiving a pop-up store. Mm. And I would add to that that the longer the pop-up store's duration, the greater number of events and animations that have to take place because the pop-up store could not be confused at any time with a traditional store. Yeah. And the choice of location and timing is crucial. I mean, the pop-up store has to appear in the right time, in the right place, and in front of the right target audience. Mm. And in addition, if I may say, a pop-up store's communications are tightly related to social media and or guerrilla marketing. Yes. Because the brand has to find ways to intrigue. You know, Oliver, it has to wow, it has to incite, and it has to make customers take action. And that being said... Communicating the pop-up store should be done in three phases, the before, the during, and the after. Okay. We cannot just communicate when the pop-up store is there. We have to build the momentum, as, as you mentioned earlier, and we have to make people want to come in and discover what happens in that pop-up store. Mm. And having said that, when we're talking about conception, the, the pop-up store has to be thought of and managed holistically because everything related to it has to speak the same language or send in the same message and it has to be very congruent with everything that surrounds it you know it has to be going with the flow of the location it has to be naturally appearing in the location and 
to finalize the points on making a pop-up store successful, I would say, Oliver, that we have to digitalize the store. Everything happening in the store could be shared and should be shared with the digital world. I mean, there should be this seamless exchange between online and offline, and this through digital maybe mirrors or pods or QR codes that allow customers to just share what they are doing in the pop-up store and put it online. And this will build further the viral environment, the online environment, and get people sharing and talking further about the pop-up store. I believe that these are key uh, elements to making a pop-up store successful. Mm. And particularly that last point, I can really see that coming true. And actually, you know, like you, you mentioned right at the beginning, preparation is key to actually make that viral entrance into the, into the market. Who have you seen do a really great job of that viral element, the social, social sharing, etc.? I can't think of a name on top of my mind, but I know most of the uh, sports brands and lots of sports brands who, collabor- who, who have done collaborations uh, with like rappers, singers, etc., have really worked on uh, these uh, aspects. Mm. Most of the pop-up stores that I have visited this year and last year, for example, in Paris, who have like uh, online shopping websites uh, and physical stores, have also created like theme shops. Uh, or environments where we could go project ourselves in the setup and then they gave us like QR code that we could scan on a pod and directly go and buy the, uh, the item online and benefit from a promotional code. And the last pop-up store that I have visited is from a digital giant who opened as well in Paris Mm -hmm. and he did not sell anything in the pop-up store. He just presented the merchandise and placed QR codes everywhere in the store so that people could scan the item and directly go onto the application and buy it if they like it. This interaction between digital and physical has become very important and is giving us the opportunity to engage with the brand, take our time to see what's happening in the pop-up, and then the buy or the purchase comes in at the latter stage. Mm. Was that last example the AliExpress pop-up store? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, if we are calling names. <laughs> yeah, no, we're okay to name names, particularly if people are doing a good job. Yeah. Happy to show the excellent examples of pop-up stores in the in the real market. Yes. I mean, I have thought of other examples that we would, uh, if you want, talk about later. Yeah, let's crack them open now. Let's hear some of the great examples you've got. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to highlight a couple of examples and why I um, I particularly thought of them. I mean, I have been pretty fond of the Huda Beauty uh, pop-up stores that, that popped in Covent Garden, I think somewhere last year yeah. around December. The Magnum Ice Cream pop-up stores uh, in London or in Paris. A French brand called Cezanne that I'm particularly fond of in terms of uh, the the theatrical aspect of pop-up store, Mm. uh, the Cartier pop-up store, and a Shiseido pop-up store. I mean, why I have particularly talked about uh, these brands, it's because um, what had drawn my attention is their atmosphere and the degree of interaction and engagement with the customers, brand reps, and the brand. Mm. Moreover, the choice of location and whether the pop-up store was Instagrammable or not and limited edition possibilities uh, and personalization possibilities. Mm. So with these examples, Oliver, what what I have been fond of is sometimes the pop-up store is very small in, in terms of format and sometimes it's very big. So every time we go into that pop-up store, we get a different feel of discovering the store, either starting by a sort of exhibition about what is the brand, its story, etc., and then dive into the products and collections. We are presented with new limited editions and so on. And finally, we could buy, purchase, or maybe pre-order. And in other pop-up stores like the Cartier pop-up store, they were launching a new uh, perfume and we got the chance, for example, to buy the new perfume and to personalize the bottle. Nice. We also went into a sort of a dark room where they shut us 
from every sensation on the outside and we got to discover what the inspiration came through our five senses. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was really interesting. Even though the pop-up store in itself looks like very simple, however, the experience that you have uh, is really important and keeps the brand in your mind for a long time. Yeah, it's a much longer play than just the actual number of days or weeks or months or whatever that it is open for. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so just, just on that, what what's your thoughts very briefly? Should a pop-up be financially viable and profitable in its own right or is it actually more of a marketing spend that is about building brand awareness and brand loyalty and looking at that longer term relationship what are your thoughts well it's um, also i have taken really the time to study that aspect through my research and i believe it's important uh, to mention here that financials of pop up stores could have two different readings and this uh, really relates to whether the brand is a matured brand or a startup brand. Mm. And I would like really to take the time to elaborate that point because we always have lots of discussions around this. I mean, in the case of, of mature brands, like I'll give an example, like uh, a luxury brand or Nike, Adidas, you name it, a mature brand that has always been on the market. So depending on the brand's budget, you could add in marketing spend or a pop-up store to include it into that budget. Mm. One should take into consideration the cost of atmospheric design, furniture, digital tools, the window. This is to, to list a few. And the cost of stock and in-store communications. There are also the costs of daily operations, such as hiring camps or managing team members, software, hardware, Wi-Fi communication, security, cleaning, and so on. The list is very long. Yeah. There are also the costs of hiring the space, and as well as the permits, contracts, or projects, like details related. I, I would name like a funny thing. Maybe you want to hire a valet service or do a night party. All of these have to be thought of. And you have to take permits for them. Mm. To add on top of all of these costs, you have the cost of your communications or events or animations that take place in that pop-up store, as we mentioned earlier. So compared to the cost of conceiving a traditional store, Oliver, pop-up store might be less expensive, but still the bill could add up very quickly. Yeah. And on the other hand, <laughs> in the case of less established brands or startup brands, there is a different perspective of calculating. I mean, a pop-up store could be a tendency for the brand to go and participate in, especially with other brands, like in multi-brand pop-up stores or collective pop-up stores. And then to share the cost uh, with other brands and to share the benefits of football from other brands. And this is a very different logic. Yeah, very good point. <laughs> exactly. And you see, we are, we are thinking of pop-up stores for startups in a different logic. Because we want to take opportunity of popping up and we want to take the opportunity of existing from time to time and getting in touch with our target audience or our potential target audience to sell merchandise and keep moving on. Mm. I mean, going back to your initial question, depending on your brand maturity and the reason of adopting pop-up store, the cost could be allocated to a marketing budget but in other cases to distribution channel budget. Mm. And to conclude, I really want to highlight here that whenever we calculate a cost uh, and put on a project, we have to calculate the return. Yep. I mean, this is how, how we've always done it in marketing. But in the case of pop-up stores, I think it's worth looking at a new term that is being discussed, which is the return on experience instead of the return on the investment. And today we are thinking that pop-up stores are there not only to yield a direct uh, result for the brand. We're talking about more brand uh, longevity in terms of building up the brand and the brand experience mm. rather than just seeing if the brand has sold a product or not during the pop-up. Yeah, I love that idea of return on experience. How do you, how do you measure that though? I, I have been doing some research lately to understand how it's being measured. There are still no clear metrics that I know of, but we're looking about uh, measuring the effects uh, of the brand, uh, the mentions, uh, the levels of the brand's talk on social media, online, offline. I mean, 
we're talking about measuring on different dimensions uh, how the brand is being talked of rather uh, talked about excuse me rather than just selling in the pop-up store because as I mentioned earlier, most of the time, brands do pop-up stores not only to sell or liquidate merchandise. They're doing like that of pop-up stores that are purely event-based. And what can we measure in an event, um, Oliver? We cannot really have lots of KPIs yeah. to measure. Rather, we're looking at um, the dimension of communications or uh, sharing uh, the pop-up store to the, the degree to which the communications of that pop-up went viral, what people are talking, how they are talking, etc. Mm. So we're rather uh, analyzing that aspect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Really interesting. And I'm sure we could go a whole lot deeper into that as a conversation. Yes. And I suppose as we come to the end of our discussion, Kalia, how can people get in touch and find out more and go deeper with you? I'm always available on my uh, Huckster Instagram page. I also have a website, huckster.fr, uh, and I'm always available on LinkedIn. I mean, a part of uh, what I preach about communicating and staying in touch, I'm really active on uh, social media pages and really love to share things about pop-up stores. So I'm always available online. Super. And I'll make sure to put all of the links to help get in touch on the show notes page, along with those uh, case study and examples that you, you highlighted earlier. And not only that, but you also wrote the book on, on this, right? Tell us a bit more about that briefly. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, the book on pop-up stores has been an exciting project uh, that I have published last year with Routledge. It's called Ephemeral Retailing, Pop-Up Stores in a Postmodern Consumption area, uh, Era. excuse me. And in this book, I really highlight on uh, what pop-up stores are and the effect of their uh, atmospheres and consumer reactions. And uh, another book is coming on the way, which talks about pop-up stores in general and how they are defined academically and professionally and should be uh, coming out at the beginning of next year. Super. So early 2021, look out for that. Do we, do we have a name for what that's going to be called or not yet? <laughs> we will reveal the name uh, soon, uh, just with uh, the reveal of the book. I mean, we're teasing a little bit. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So if you are listening and you think you you fancy getting in touch with Halia, then do absolutely do that and do check out her book. I'm sure it's going to be awesome when it comes out early next year. This has been a, a brilliant conversation. I've really loved diving into this. We could have gone in so many different directions and there are lots of different avenues that would be great to explore. So I'm sure people will have lots of conversations and lots of questions to continue on afterwards. Thank you so much for, for joining me on the show. Like I say, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Oliver, for this opportunity. It was great. And hopefully we we'll meet again in new uh, retailing uh, discussions and projects. Definitely. Thank you so much, Halia. Thank you, Oliver. Have a nice day. So there we go, a great conversation with Khalia Bustani all about pop-up stores and ephemeral retailing. Do check out the show notes page, which is obandco.uk slash 109 today. And there are examples and some videos there to catch up and find out a little bit more about pop-up stores and some of the great examples that we were talking about in the conversation. So do head over there, obandco.uk slash 109. And finally, I'd like to make a very short little announcement, something that I'm really excited about. Christmas is coming, of course, certainly at the time of uh, recording. I guess whenever you listen to this, Christmas is still going to be coming. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's been a tough year in 2020 for, for many in retail. So I'm absolutely delighted and proud to be able to host a virtual charity event. It's going to be a Christmas quiz night, all themed around retail. And it's called It's Quizmas. I'm really excited about this. I'm going to be hosting it with Ed Armishaw, and it is all in aid of supporting the Retail Trust, which is a charity to support everyone in retail. So I'm really proud to be able to put this on for you and for everyone in the retail community. So do come along and buy a ticket, donate to this amazing cause of the Retail Trust. 
And you can find out more at obandco.uk slash quizmas. That's obandco.uk slash q-u-i-z-m-a-s, quizmas. I really look forward to seeing you there. Thank you once again for tuning in to this episode. If you are new to the show, do remember to hit subscribe in your favourite podcast app and you can catch new episodes which come out every single week. And with that, I will very much look forward to joining you in another episode very soon. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>